Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, last week, we finished up <clears throat> the death and resurrection of Jesus, went through the rest of that scripture, um, talked about how believing is not always seen, right? Um, sometimes all the time we have to put our faith in something that goes beyond our understanding. And so I'm going to move away from those teachings uh, that surround the Easter holiday and the foundation of what we believe as Christians and move into just more practical application of how we are to live a life after God. And I was just reading, uh, praying about what to teach on this week, and God brought me to First Thessalonians, which I haven't read a ton of, um, but it's jam-packed with a lot of great scriptures, a lot of great teachings from Paul himself to the church of the Thessalonians. So I want to start in chapter four. So First Thessalonians chapter four. And what I'm titling this teaching is Children of the Day. Um, this is a scripture that I posted for Scripture of the Week, if some of you follow that. Um, but it's one I don't ever recall reading. And I really liked the use of day versus night, light versus darkness, because God is light. So children of the day. So we're talking about what exactly that means, right? What does living for the day look like? So starting in chapter four, I'm going to read through here and I'll stop um, as we hit certain points along the way here. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So this section of my Bible is called Living to Please God. So just a little background. Um, the Church of, Church of the Thessalonians, so think of Macedonia area. They've established their faith. They're very receptive to God. They turned down their idols. They took down their um, idol altars, things like that. Their spiritual health overall is really well. So Paul is peached basically to hear that these group of people are thriving in, in this church creation, in this first Christian community we see in the New Testament. And so he's saying, yes, you know, thank you. I've heard of your faith. I'm seeing it's true. You know, I've sent, I've sent Timothy ahead to be my messenger. He's reported back the good health that you have, the spiritual health, the, the over overwhelming just well-being of this entire group of people so he's very pleased with them but he's still urging them right that there's more and there's more you can do and we'll talk about that a little bit more because he calls that out specifically those words a couple times throughout this scripture so continuing in verse three it is god's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So this is a friendly reminder from Paul to this group of people, um, which we'll go through here, touch on some key points throughout both of these chapters that we'll read. But he's reminding them, I'm calling you to be pure. If you're rejecting that teaching, if you're rejecting that understanding, you're not rejecting me, you're rejecting God, right? Because that is God's will for this, this group of people for their lives. Verse nine, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you brothers and sisters to do so more and more. There he goes again for the second time to say that. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So a couple more reminders to love each other, to lead a quiet life, 
you know, work hard, mind your own business, right? No, no judgment of others. That's what it's saying is you love people. He's not asking you to do anything else. He's not asking you to give your opinion or to place them in a certain expectation that you have or a bubble of somebody. And the next section here is specifically addresses believers who have died. So I had to imagine in these times there were some questions about, okay, Jesus is returning, right? We just ended up finishing up that teaching last week. So they understand that there is the second coming. But what about those who are already gone? What about our relatives that we care about? Are we ever going to see them again? So Paul addresses them here, um, starting with verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So through Holy Spirit that Jesus has given his disciples, Paul is imparting wisdom and, and comfort to these people, right? So that they may be able to encourage others. That it's not limited to just them, but the loved ones that have also passed on, will once again, they will see, right? They'll all be taken up into eternal salvation with God. Uh, moving into chapter five. <laughs> Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet, which that is uh, chapter five, verse eight is our scripture of the week. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So this section is kind of really what inspired this teaching. Um, talking about children of the day. So let me go back and read this part again. And we'll kind of talk through it a little more. So starting in verse four, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So what he's saying, when God returns, nobody knows when that is, even us, right? Even those who are followers of God. We don't know the time, the date, there are, um, prophecies and revelation people study that section of the bible for that reason to try to anticipate when jesus's return is coming which basically follows any kind of certain events right chain reactions um, and that's what a lot of people study and look for and focus on but he's saying you're not going to be surprised because it's you're not in darkness, right? It's not going to be like a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep. So there's two versions of asleep that we're seeing in these scriptures. And I just want to clarify um, before I go on. We have a sleep as in past, okay? I had talked to you already about that um, before we wrapped up chapter four, that believers who have died section. He uses the word asleep here for those who have died and have passed on. 
And in chapter five, when we talk about do not be like others who are asleep, we're talking a spiritual asleep, right? A spiritually tuned out person. Um, so they're not on their alert. They maybe, you know, hide things in the darkness. They're not living for the light. They're not living for the day. But let us be awake and sober. So awake as an alert and knowing that where we stand with God, we're ready whenever he returns. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, which this is the scripture again of the week, verse eight. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So we rely on these things, faith, love, salvation, all of the things Jesus has given us that we talked about last week. Those are the things we rely on. Those are the things that help us function as children of the day. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, so here alive or dead, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So this is meant to be more encouragement from Paul in this section as well, um, for them to be alert, which I love this because before Jesus dies, he tells the disciples to be alert, to stay awake. And he even gets after them a couple of times because they fall asleep on him. But he's saying there's going to be temptation. There's going to be turmoil and trouble. You need to be alert and awake. and You need to rely on the faith and the love and the hope of salvation that I've given you through my death on the cross. And that's exactly what Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of here. And you're doing that as encouragement one to one another. It's not just for you, for your comfort, for your peace, but it's for those around you um, that are maybe concerned about what's to come or what's happening in the world or when Jesus will return. Um, I see this a lot. People get fixated on the future and we lose hope in the world, but we can't lose hope in God, okay? So a lot of people just say, you know, I hear it's, it's time, it's coming, you know, we're seeing all these things come to fruition. I think this person represents, you know, the, um, this, this evil character that's supposed to come into play, according to Revelation, there's a lot of fixation on this, but that's not the point of what this teaching is. The point is being awake and alert in your own life, in your own relationship with the Lord to understand that when he returns, that you will be ready, um, that you will have crowns to lay at his feet, right? You hear that in scripture as well. And people talk about, you know, what do you have if you're one-on-one -on -one with Jesus at the gates and he's like, okay, you're here. What did you do for me, right? And you have all these armfuls of crowns of people you helped, of um, maybe ministries you started, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be grand. It can be small. Um, whatever blessings you imparted, whatever love you gave people, whatever forgiveness you gave people, that's what God is expecting from you. Um, starting with verse 12, we'll read through a couple more here. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Not just some people. It says with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will 
do it. I love that last uh, scripture as Paul wraps this up to the church. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So reminding ourselves, our faith is based on the evidence that God is faithful, right? That his promises come to fruition in our life if we just listen and be obedient to what he has for us. So I want to kind of recap this entire few chapters that we've read here. And I asked this question at the beginning of the teaching, but I'll ask it again, is what does living for the day look like? So throughout this reading, um, everything I've just read to you, I've identified 10 different things, 10 different examples that we can live by um, following a life after God. So number one, you live holy and you live honorable, you maintain purity. So this can be in a lot of different ways. Um, and the scripture I have to read before I go into further explanation is Matthew 5, 8. Is blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So it's the pure that sees God. So we're talking about holy and honorable. We maintain purity. That's our bodies. That is what we watch, what we hear, what we say. Um, if you're living holy and honorable, there's a righteousness about you, right? And it's, I'm not, don't mix that with pride. You don't need to go around thinking you're better than everybody. That's not what this is at all, but it's, it's maintaining respect for yourself and for God and who he made you to be. It's that righteousness that he bestows on us, that he allows us to achieve through him, through obedience and through listening and in a relationship with him. So number two, we love and encourage others so that I pretty much in every teaching I do, that seems to come up as a huge point. And it really is um, not just loving, but encouraging everybody. That's what it said. in, in um, let's see, that was verse 14, chapter five, but be patient with everyone. There are no certain people that deserve your love deserve your encouragement more than others and I think that's something we have to remind ourselves of on a daily basis but it's important because that is the that is the way we set the example of who Jesus was on earth simple as that um, so Hebrews 10 24 through 25 I want to read here it says and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this is like an urgency, all of these, right? Because we don't know when Jesus is returning. So start now. That's the whole point. Something I have to remind myself of too every single day. Start now, not tomorrow, not next week, not I'm going to change a couple months from now. Now is the time to redirect your life, to repent of the sin that you have and to turn towards God, right? To, to rest in his faith and the hope and the love and salvation that he gives us. Number three, lead a quiet life. I love this one um, and something I try to achieve as well for myself. Um, and that can really be open to interpretation. Um, and this scripture is specifically talking about, you know, minding your own business. Um, sometimes we get involved in things we shouldn't be. Uh, sometimes we express opinions where we shouldn't express them, um, especially with such movements, you know, as free speech and everything we've seen in the past, even century. Um, a lot of people find pride and they find hope in that, right? They hope in that the ability to say whatever we want to say but when you're leading a quiet life you're listening right you're not talking outwardly about things that god is not instructing you to say you're listening and you're acting based on his response to you right the relationship that you have with god so first peter 3 4 it says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which is of great worth in God's sight. So also leading a quiet life. It's that quiet spirit. It's a gentleness, right? It's a meekness. When you're humble, um, you're radiating God from the inside out. It's not about what's going on out here. And that's what's most important is when you have such distraction going on out here, sometimes God can't use you because you're so focused on what you look like or what other people are going to think. But when your heart is really the one shining, you're not worried about what you're wearing, what your hair is, if you have makeup on or not, that is when God can really move. And that, he says, is great worth in my sight in this scripture. Number four, finding hope in Jesus's return. So we are hopeful, right? When Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't it. Um, There will be a day where we will get the promised salvation, the eternal life with God, that he will take us up with him into heaven. And so I want to read 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. So we don't lose hope because we know, yes, we are physically, our bodies are dying every day, right? We get another day older. Things start breaking down. Our bodies don't function as well. Our metabolism slows down. There's a lot of things that happen. Um, And we are not meant to to live forever on this planet. That was not God's intention, but we have this hope of this eternal glory. It far outweighs any kind of trouble or anxiety you can encounter while here. And so that's why you fix your eyes. You find that hope and that promise and that in Jesus's return, that one day we will have that one day. We will be back together with those that we've lost or that we mourn and with God, right? With the creator of the world and of our lives, which is incredible. Number five, don't fixate on what's to come or anticipate the future. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I know a lot of people who specialize in Revelation and the coming of Jesus and trying to pinpoint exactly what events in this current world lead to Jesus's return. And honestly, I it is important for studies like that, don't get me wrong. The revelation is part of the Bible for a reason. But there are people who take it too far and fixate on that. I use that word because it becomes an obsession. And you lose sight of what's here, what's going on here, right? You're more worried about what's out there when you're not looking at your own life. You're not looking at your own relationship with God. That's why I really wanted to touch on this. So there's two scriptures here that support this thought. So Psalm 94, 19, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. So consolation also meaning comfort. And then the next one is Acts 1, 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. So this is not only talking about Jesus' return, but understanding how how time works in our own lives um, how we see things come to fruition how we pray about things and maybe it's years later that God answers those prayers that can cause a lot of confusion for us but we have to remember that it is not for us to know the times of the day because it's his authority and it's God's plan and we have to trust and have faith that it is a plan that's going to benefit our life number six So this was our scripture of the week. Stay awake and alert, resting in faith and love with the hope of salvation. So it talked about the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation. So Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And I read that um, in verse 24 of chapter five. That's how Paul ended this this letter to the Thessalonians, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. 
saying the exact same thing here in this scripture. And we can rest in that. We can find peace in that faith and that hope that we profess because of that reason, because God is faithful. Number seven, live in peace and patience. Yes, this is hard for some of us. Um, but understanding that life doesn't have to be chaotic. If you thrive on that and you're one of those people, I understand, but I don't understand why you would want to be one of those people, why you would want to put yourself in that position to experience that anxiety and that fear and that dread and that anger, right? All those things come with those who are in constant chaos. Um, you know, it, it follows them wherever they go. You know, we talk about bad things happening to good people. Sometimes, depending on how we're reacting to the world around us, those things can seem more and more prevalent in our lives. But we're seeking to live in peace and patience. So we talked about patience a little earlier when we talked about loving and encouraging others. They go hand in hand. If you're loving somebody that you don't really like, it's going to take a lot of patience for you to do that, for you to take, take a deep gulp and swallow your pride and smile at them or, or buy them something or wave at them, whatever it may be. So living in peace and patience. So Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. So constantly around us, things are happening. Um, people maybe get ahead that we don't think deserve it. Um, other things like that, but we're just understanding that we have to be still and we have to wait patiently for God. Because what he's doing in one person's life is going to be different than what he is doing in yours. And there is a reason for that, because you have your own special plan and path that he's ordained for your life. So living in peace and patience with everyone, your family, yourself, your job, your coworkers, whoever it may be. Number eight, seek goodness daily, not just for yourself, but for everyone around you. So I talked about in, um, I think it was in chapter five, making sure that uh, nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So you're really in tune to how you're personally reacting to people around you and how other people in your sphere of influence are also reacting. It's, it's an encouragement that we need to offer one, one another. And so Galatians 6.10 is the verse I want to read here. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So it's important to love, to encourage, and to seek goodness for everyone around you. Um, there are cases where you may have tried and tried to do that for a particular person and it's constantly rejected. You're not held to that expectation. Do you still love them? Yes. Do you still try to encourage them? Yes. But saying here, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, that's really an encouragement and it's a love towards people that are living a life similar to yours. Not that you're not called to also love people that aren't because that is how those people get to know God, right? Start a relationship, turn their life over, repent of their sin. That is an important step. But you're not, like I said, held to being responsible um, if someone is, is rejecting. Because it says in scripture, it's not rejecting you, the human, is rejecting God whenever there's, there's tension or there's disagreement. Number nine, rejoice and pray continuously. So this is a really good one um, because things happen on a minute by minute basis, good, bad. We get surprised, we get upset, we get anxious, we get fearful. Something comes up we're, um, we're worried about or, or we don't know how quite how to solve or to answer problems. Rejoicing and praying are everything. Prayer is not just about what you need. 
but it's about who God is, right? So you don't start with God, I need, I need, I need. He knows exactly what you need. And sometimes, most of the time, what you're asking for and thinking you need is not actually what you need. Um, so Philippians 4, 6 is do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So I love this because I've really been practicing this myself in my own life, but it doesn't matter how small it is. I take it to God. I thank him for it. And I ask for help or for answers or for knowledge and wisdom or whatever it may be. And he cares about everything. And when you get in the habit of taking everything to him, every decision, every to-do list for your day, I've mentioned that before, it becomes clearer and clearer what exactly you're meant to do. And there's peace and there's rest that comes with that. And there's time, right? He is the God of time. He created it. He is not bound by it. So he can increase it, right? He can give you more and more. And number 10, living a blameless life. So this is, you probably think, okay, Lindsay, that's a big ask because um, we are all human. And this is not going to be 100%. Um, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. That is just, unfortunately, who we are as humans. But it allows us to have a need for God. So I don't take that for granted at all. But striving to live a blameless life. We talked about um, holy and honorable, that righteousness as number one. And this, this next scripture kind of sums this up perfect, perfectly. It's Philippians 2. 14 through 16. It says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. So we talked about laboring probably a month ago or so. But when you're living blameless and pure, you're living in righteousness, right? There is no fault that someone can bring against you, uh, especially, like I said, in this warped and crooked generation that Paul explains to, um, or that Philippians in this scripture has explained but you shine, right? You shine when you hold firmly to the word of life because it is light. We talked about that being children of the day. That is the purpose of it. And you can, you can take pride, not be prideful, but in understanding that you lived for the day. And this is exactly what it looks like. It's living holy and honorable. It's maintaining purity, loving, encouraging others. You're leading a quiet life. You're finding hope in Jesus's return. You're not fin fixating on what's to come. You stay awake and you alert. You rest in that the breastplate of that love and that faith, and you have the hope of salvation. You live in peace and patience. You seek goodness daily for everyone. Rejoice and you pray continuously, which leads to living a blameless life. And I know that seems like a large ask on a daily basis for one single person. Um, but as you, as you start to form a relationship with God, as you start to put some of these things in practice, they naturally flow together. It's not like I have a checklist of these 10 things every morning. I'm like, okay, did I love and encourage everybody I came in, in contact with? Check. Um, okay, did I, did I, was I patient today? Did I get anxious at all or fearful? Check. That's not how it works. These are what we can strive for. They're just practical examples, as I said at the beginning of the teaching, to be able to refocus our life to living a life that reflects God, that reflects who Jesus was on earth. And at the end of the day, that is what God is calling us to do, wherever that may take you. It may be within your families. It may be within your job. You may be actually starting ministries. You may be impacting women's ministries, whatever it may be. There is a rhyme and a reason to it, but that is how we, we succeed in who God created us to be. So I hope 
this brings encouragement, talking about loving, encouraging others um, to those that are watching. Thank you again for following along with me. Um, I'll plan to be back next week with another teaching. And in the meantime, I hope you have a good rest of the week. Thank you.